Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Thursday's broadcast of The Gospel Truth. Today I'm continuing our series on hardness of heart. This is about the end of my third week. Tomorrow's going to be my last day to teach on this. And I tell you, this is just powerful stuff that I've been sharing. These are foundational truths, things that I use every day of my life. And if you've missed any of this teaching, please write in and get either our book or we have DVDs and CDs of this. I tell you, this is the kind of thing that you need to go back over and over again and again. And also, uh, these materials would help you to be able to share this with other people. Remember that tomorrow is going to be my last day to make these offers. So please go to the effort of writing or calling and requesting these materials today. We've talked about the crisis of hardness of heart, the cause of a hardened heart. And this week I've been talking about how do you cure this. Of course, the cure is based on what the cause is. The cause of a hardened heart is whatever you focus your attention upon, your heart becomes sensitive to. And conversely, whatever you fail to focus on, your heart becomes insensitive or hardened towards. And so the majority of people, it is not sin that hardens our heart. Now, sin does harden our heart, but I'm saying that's not the only thing. With most Christians, it is not just out-and-out out sin and rebellion towards God that is causing us to be insensitive towards God, but it's being preoccupied with the things of this world. I was making the point this week that in the same way that faith comes by hearing, Romans 10, 17, likewise, unbelief comes by hearing. And we are hearing unbelief and negativism and criticism and just all kinds of negative things spoken, and it brings unbelief to us. And so the point that I've been making out of Matthew chapter 17, verse 20, the disciples of Jesus tried to cast the demons out of a boy who had uh, what the Scripture here calls a lunatic spirit. It was a demon-possessed boy, and they tried to cast the demon out and couldn't. And they were confused because they had the power to cast demons out. They had exercised it before, but this time... They believed and didn't get the right results. It's too simplistic to believe that if you just have faith that everything's going to work because unbelief negates and cancels our faith. And so Jesus, when he told them what was the problem was, he said in Matthew chapter 17, verse 20, it's because of your unbelief. Again, I want to just point out that the NIV says it's because of your little faith but that's not accurate. It's very clear that it's because of your unbelief. The rest of that verse goes on to say, for if you only have a little bit of faith, like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, be removed, cast into the sea, and it'll obey you. And then the NIV just totally omits the 21st verse. It's not even there. So not against anybody. I'm not trying to make a statement. I'm just saying that this is accurate, that you can have faith and yet unbelief will negate your faith. And so you not only need to have faith, and this to me really answered questions because I've given examples of where I knew I was believing God and yet I didn't see the miracle come to pass that I was believing for and I was confused because I knew there was faith in my heart. But in this very instance, I took this same thing over in Mark chapter 9 where it's recorded a little bit differently and in that instance, the father of the child said, Lord, I believe help my unbelief. And so he said that he had faith, but he had unbelief at the same time. And his unbelief was negating his faith. So what we've got to do is not only try and build faith. I think most Christians are trying to accumulate faith. They know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So they get into the Word and they get their faith energized. But very few Christians understand that unbelief comes by hearing anything that is contrary to God's Word. So they'll spend time in a Bible study, they'll spend time studying the Word, and then go wash it down with an hour's worth of news or a couple of hours' worth of an ungodly program or movie or something that just totally negates the benefit. If you are really going to see the supernatural power of God operate in your life on a consistent basis, you're going to have to be committed to that and so focused on it that you aren't allowing any unbelief to come towards you. And I've already dealt with a lot of these things this week. What I want to get into today 
is after Jesus said, it's your unbelief that's the problem, not your little faith or the fact that you don't have faith. You've got faith, but you had unbelief that negated it. Let me just turn over to Mark chapter 9 and read this again. I've already read this, but in Mark chapter 9, when they brought the boy unto Jesus, this is in verse 20, it says, And they brought him unto him, brought the boy unto Jesus, and when he saw him, straightway the Spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. Now, what this is describing is that when they brought this boy who had this demonic spirit to Jesus, he had a seizure or something. He fell on the ground and wallowed foaming at the mouth. I don't know if any of you have ever seen anybody have a seizure like that, but I guarantee you, I, I've been in a number of situations where I've seen this, and it, it will cause the hair on the back of your neck to stand up. I remember when I was in high school, I was in choir, and we were having a choir concert, and there was a girl standing on the bleachers in front of me. There was about 100 kids in this choir, and this girl and I went to church together, and... Uh, I don't know, but she started having an epileptic seizure right there as we were in the midst of this performance for our high school, and she turned around and looked at me, and um, I could get really graphic, but it just scared the fire out of me. I mean, I didn't know what to do. It, it just literally nearly overwhelmed me. If you've ever been in a situation like, say, for instance, you're trying to cast the demon out of a person, and instead of them being delivered and praising God and joy and peace. Instead, they fall on the ground and go to wallow and foaming. I don't know if any of you have ever experienced that. I have, but I can guarantee you it does something to you. And what it does, it immediately tells you it isn't working. It's worse instead of better. And your eyes immediately start communicating unbelief to you. Now, go back to um, Matthew chapter 17. After Jesus said, it's your unbelief that's the problem. If your faith is only the size of a mustard seed, you can do this. Then he said in verse 21, Howbeit this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. This is probably one of the most misinterpreted scriptures in the Bible because the way that this is traditionally understood is that this kind of demon, remember they were casting the demon out of a boy, and people will say this kind of demon only comes out with much prayer and fasting. And there are some people that teach that you have to pray and fast and do all of these things, that there are some demons that are stronger than others, and some, boy, you know, you have to pray and fast to really get anything done. I want you to know that there is no demon that won't respond to the name of Jesus and simple faith in his name. You do not have to pray and fast to get certain demons out. If you ever meant a demon who wouldn't respond to faith in the name of Jesus, then your prayer and fasting is not going to add anything to it. This is not talking about that certain demons only respond to your holiness and your intensity and how much you've prayed and fasted. Now, I'm aware that that's taught a lot. Matter of fact, I remember an instance where they brought a woman to me. It's a long story, but she was a severely uh, demonized person. And they had me pray and fast for a week before I met with her so that I could cast this demon out. And when I met with her, it wasn't necessary. I just told her the Word of God, and she got set free before I ever prayed for her. She got set free. Psalms 107, verse 20 says, God sent His Word and healed them and delivered them from all of their destructions. So I've been in that situation. I've been through these things. I'm not insensitive to what some of you are feeling right now, but I'm just telling you that this is not saying that certain kinds of demons only come out through prayer and fasting. You know what the subject of the sentence is? In verse 20, he says, the problem is your unbelief. And then he had this statement about if your faith is only the size of a grain of mustard seed. But let's just drop that for a moment because what he's talking about, here's the problem is your unbelief, and this kind of unbelief comes out only by prayer and fasting. This isn't saying that certain types of demons respond to prayer and fasting. The name of Jesus and faith in his name is enough to deal with the devil himself and any demon that exists underneath him. You do not have to have prayer and fasting to get rid of the devil. But there are certain types of unbelief or kinds of unbelief that only come out by prayer and fasting. Boy, that's a major revelation right there. And some of you are thinking, well, kinds of unbelief. Isn't unbelief unbelief? 
You know, I can't show you a chapter and verse on this, but this you can take this as andeology if you want to and just file it away and meditate on it. But think about this. I believe I've got three categories of unbelief that I, that I put all unbelief into these three categories. One of them is just unbelief that comes through ignorance. You know, you don't know the truth. And if you don't know it, the Bible says faith is based on knowledge. Basically, that's a paraphrase of 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, or 1 through 4. And faith is based on knowledge. If you, like, say, for instance, I was raised in a denomination that didn't teach that God did miracles. Uh, they actually taught against it, but for a large period of my life, I didn't know that anybody experienced miracles. Everybody I knew just went to the doctor. They believed that you had to go to the doctor. They didn't expect miraculous things. And so I had unbelief when it came to believing for healing, not because I was taught against it necessarily, but just because I wasn't taught the Word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word. So if you don't know what the Word says, there isn't going to be faith present. You are just going to automatically disbelieve. So that is one type of unbelief that is just based on ignorance. Or, you know, if you want to be politically correct, lack of knowledge. That would be a kinder, gentler way of saying it. But for me, it's just you're ignorant. <laughs> I don't mean that mean to anybody, but, you know, we are just ignorant sometimes and don't know what the Word says. How do you deal with that kind of unbelief? It's real simple. You tell a person the truth, and they're no longer ignorant. Now they have to decide, are they going to believe it or not? But once the truth comes, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word, and you can overcome an unbelief that is based on ignorance by just telling a person the truth. The second type of unbelief is an unbelief that isn't based on ignorance. You are taught. You're just taught the wrong thing. And, you know, in my own personal life, there was a period of time that I just never thought about miracles because the group that I was raised in, that they didn't operate in them. But then when the charismatic movement came along and people started saying that there were gifts of the Spirit and miracles and things happened, there began to be real strong teaching that those things passed away with the apostles, that that doesn't happen today. And they began to put forth this unbelief and say that you would be demon-possessed if you spoke in tongues or did any of these kind of things. Now, see, that's unbelief also. But that unbelief is based on knowledge. It's not ignorance. You got knowledge. It's just the wrong knowledge. And the cure for that is basically the same as the first type of unbelief. You tell a person the truth. The cure is the same, but it's harder to get the wrong knowledge out of you and to tear that down and erase that than it is just to put the right knowledge on the inside of a person. So if you were comparing those two, it's a lot easier to reach a person who is ignorant about the truth than it is a person who's been taught the wrong thing. It would be similar to having a blackboard or something where, you know, if you'd never written anything on it, well, then you just go in there and write on it, and that, that's done. But if you've already got that blackboard filled with writing and it's all wrong, well, then you've got to erase all that other stuff and clean the board and wipe it clean before you can write the right stuff on there. So those first two types of unbelief, whether it's based on ignorance or wrong teaching, the antidote for both of those is basically just tell a person the truth. And once a person knows the truth, they can overcome one with greater difficulty than the other, but they can overcome unbelief that is based on either ignorance or on wrong teaching. But then there's a third type of unbelief, and I believe that's what he's talking about right here, and that's an unbelief that just comes through your five senses. In other words, you, you are, let's say, for instance, you're praying for a person to be healed, and instead they fall over and they're dead. You know what? Without you being taught against healing or, or any of these kind of things, your senses are just immediately going to speak to you, well, they're dead. They aren't healed. It didn't work. It failed. Let's say, for instance, you've got a doctor's report and you have a cancer or something. You pray. You go back to the doctor and the doctor says, whoops, still there. It's gotten worse. Well, it's not necessarily the fact that you've been taught wrong. That's not based on ignorance. It's not based on wrong teaching. It's just the fact that here you are hearing something that is contrary to what you believe. And you know what? All of us were raised basically to respond to our five senses, what you see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. If you pray for something and see something opposite to what you're praying for, instantly you're going to have a thought of unbelief. If you pray for something and hear something different than what you've prayed for, 
instantly there's going to be unbelief. And so this is what I call just natural unbelief. Here's what the Word says. Here's what you're believing for. Here's what you're seeing and feeling and hearing. Those things are just going to naturally minister unbelief. Thoughts of doubt and unbelief to you, like here's what the Word says, but here's what I'm seeing. And if, and if you don't know the truth and haven't renewed yourself, you are instantly going to be having this unbelief negate and cancel or dilute your faith. Man, that's powerful truth right there. Just that understanding is going to help you a lot uh, to recognize that there are different kinds of unbelief. And I believe that when Jesus said here, how be it this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting, he's talking about this kind of unbelief. Remember over in Mark chapter 9, when they brought the boy to Jesus, he fell on the ground and wallowed and foamed. Now again, I refer to the fact that the disciples had cast demons out before. And they came back and said, Lord, even the devils are subject to us. But there isn't a single question about why did it take so long? Why did we see the, it get worse before it got better? And the absence of them asking any questions like that implies that they really hadn't experienced this level of opposition and resistance. You know, I cast a lot of demons out of people, and I've seen people that just instantly get set free, and there's basically nothing to it. I've had other people that when you pray for them, it gets worse before it gets better. There's many times that Jesus would cast demons out of people and the spirits would tear them is what the scripture says. In other words, it would be like on their way out, they just put this person in agony and people would fall on the ground or like this boy, they fell on the ground and wallowed and foamed at the mouth. And you know what? Supposing that this same boy who did this had that same manifestation of this spirit when the disciples were trying to cast it out, you know what I believe the problem was? They had faith and they didn't have ignorance or unbelief that came through ignorance. They knew it was God's will to heal. They didn't have unbelief that came through wrong teaching. They hadn't been taught that miracles passed away midnight the previous day or something like that. They were believing, but their unbelief came through. They, they saw a manifestation that was contrary to what they were believing for. And there is no indication that they had experienced that before. And again, I go back to this fact, you know, I, I've told you that I saw a number of people who've had epileptic seizures and things like this. And when things like that happen, I guarantee you, it grabs your five senses. It will command your attention. And it will instantly begin to start releasing unbelief towards you. So how is it you overcome the unbelief that comes through ignorance and through wrong teaching by just hearing the Word of God? But how do you overcome what you're seeing with your eyes, what you hear with your ears, what you feel in your body? You're praying for healing, but your body is screaming that you still have pain or whatever. How do you overcome that kind of unbelief? The scripture here, Jesus said it's through prayer and fasting. Now that is a profound truth. And let me give you the reason. I'm going to have to start this today and I'll have to continue it and conclude it on my program tomorrow. But here's the reason that prayer and fasting affects this type of unbelief that I just call a natural unbelief. Just a natural result of what you see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. When you are praying, you are going beyond your five senses. First of all, you're praying to a God that you can't see or hear. And yet you're talking to him as if he's real. And if it's a godly type of prayer, that's not just a monologue where you're just doing all of the talking, but if you are really listening, and if you're hearing God speak to you, not only are you talking to a God that you can't see and hear, but you are hearing a God that you can't hear with your ears. You are moving beyond the five senses. You're moving beyond the limitations of your five senses and you're becoming aware that there is a spirit world. And if you do this on a regular basis, if you pray to God, like I could give you hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of examples where I have prayed and in communication with God, I've asked Him for wisdom. Matter of fact, I, I won't take the time to give you the details, but just in the last couple of weeks, I had a decision to make that I was going to do something that was going to cost me three or four million dollars to get it accomplished. I had to make a decision within 24 hours of whether to go ahead with this. And before I told my staff, 
what I was going to do. I said, let me pray about it. And you know what? I started praying and beseeching God. And I mean, within minutes, God showed me something. I went and acted on it, and it saved me three or four million dollars. <laughs> That's pretty, I don't know about you, but that really blessed me. That's an up-to-date, current example of what I'm talking about. And you start praying like that, and you see miracles come through, and people raise from the dead, and blind eyes open, and God tells you to do things. And after a while, you know what? You train these five senses that there is more to what reality is than just what you can perceive with your five senses. See, we do this in the natural realm. Right now, you're watching a television. And did you know that there are multiple television stations wherever you are? Wherever you are, there's more than just this program coming in. There are multiple television signals, either coming through a cable or coming through satellite, through the air. But they're there, and you can't see them or hear them. You can't discern it with just your five senses. You have to take a set and plug it in, turn it on, and tune it in. And that set doesn't produce the signal. All it does is receive the signal that is already there, but it's just in a realm that you can't perceive. And you translate it through a television set into a sound and, and sight that you can perceive. But I think all of us have come to grips that, you know what, when you're driving in your car, there's radio signals. There's television signals right there. When you're in your house, wherever you are, there are these signals already there. You just can't perceive them. Well, in a sense, when you're praying, see, this is what you're doing. You're talking to a God that you can't see, that you can't hear. And then you're hearing from a God that you can't hear with your physical ears. You have to hear with your heart. And if you operate in prayer like that, then what happens is over a period of time, you see the proof of it. You educate your senses that there is more than what you can see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. And then when you pray for a healing and the person that you are praying for looks like they're dead, if, if all you've ever done is operate in just the natural realm, you will be bound to say, well, they're dead because this is what I see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. But if you've trained yourself through prayer, speaking to God and communicating and proving that the unseen God is real and that the unseen world is real and that there's things beyond your five senses, then when you see something contrary to what you've prayed, you'll be able to remember. And your senses will say, oh, yeah, you know, I can't see, taste, hear, smell, or feel it, but it's one of those faith things. We've seen this work before. And you can train your senses to where they will respond to faith. You know, I'm about out of time today, but Hebrews chapter 5, I'm going to give you a scripture tomorrow, and we'll start on that and talk about how you can, through exercise, train your senses to discern even into the spiritual realm. And uh, this is basically what Jesus is saying. This is the way you overcome this natural type of unbelief is you have to start spending time operating in the unseen through prayer and fasting. And if you'll do this, you can actually train your senses to where they won't fight against you, but they'll submit to the uh, faith that you're operating in. Andrew's complete teaching series titled Hardness of Heart is available on either CD or on DVD as seen on our daily TV program. Each is offered for 13 pounds. Remember to specify the CD or DVD when you order. This series is also available for audio download absolutely free on our website. Go to awme.net. After choosing English, click on resources at the top of the page and then MP3 downloads. If you prefer, the Hardness of Heart teaching series is available in book form when you send six pounds. The fourth audio teaching in today's series is available for three pounds when you write or call. But if you're simply unable to afford it, Andrew and his partners will send this fourth CD titled, The Cure, Free of Charge. We'd like to remind you that we're offering Andrew's latest book titled, Effortless Change for £8.50. Contact us today to get your copy. You can use your credit card to order resources by telephone. Our helpline number is 01922 473 300. When calling from outside the UK, you must dial your international calling code, then 44 1922 473 300. Helpline hours are from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. 
or you can visit our website where you can order ministry materials 24 hours a day, seven days a week at awme.net. To write us, use the address on your screen. We hope to hear from you today. For eight years, Richard Anthony Walker struggled with debilitating and life-threatening health issues. I was regularly walking on crutches. I was taking a lot of painkillers and I was in a pretty bad way. And Charlie prayed his prayer and I walked away and I still felt the pain, but I knew and I believed that I was healed. Today, he's totally and completely healed. I'm healed. That's it. I'm healed. Everything. I'm healed. Everything. Everything is healed. Check out his story today. Log on to awmi.net. Look to the left and click on Ministry News. Discover what's happening at Andrew Womack Ministries. When Andrew and Jamie were young, they went to a conference on biblical prosperity. They desperately wanted to get the teaching, but simply could not afford it. Andrew promised God that if he was ever in a position to make his teaching available, he would never deny it to someone for lack of funds. And that's what motivated me really to give, is uh, the fact that he gives his stuff away. Our hearts are just tied with what Andrew's doing, what he's trying to accomplish. A partnership is helping do what I can't do. I know that I'm a part of something so big. And my gifts can help reach the nations and the people. Whoever has ears to hear, they will hear. There's much more than just classroom activity at Karis Bible College. Students participate in hands-on ministry, like working on the ministry helpline. I'm a first year student at CBC and I work in the phone center full time. I'm a second year student at CBC and I work full time in the phone ministry. 90% of the volunteers in the phone center are Karis Bible College students. Thank you for calling Andrew Womack Ministries. 80% of the employees are CBC graduates. I'm a graduate of CBC, and I've been working in the phone center for two years. The ministry and the college are working hand in hand to deliver the gospel truth every day. We're changing lives and we're changing the world one life at a time. 